A high quality government that's accountable, honest, competent and effective. Now that's the vision articulated by Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung when he announced the upcoming changes to Singapore's political system in January the 27th. The Singapore system has always been a work in progress, something that's been tweaked and modified over the years to ensure it can continue meeting the challenges faced by the nation as defined by the government. It's certainly not the first time we are reforming our electoral system. Now, back in 1984, the NCMP scheme, or non-constituency MP scheme, was introduced to guarantee opposition voices in Parliament. Now, this was followed by the GRC system in 1988, which came on board to ensure ethnic minority representation in Parliament. And in 1991, the elected presidency was created as a stabilizer, a, a second key to protect the reserve, so to speak. Interestingly, these are some these are the same innovations that will be further modified this time. The number of NCMP seats will be increased to ensure up to 12 opposition seats in Parliament at any one time. There will be more, there will be smaller GRCs, which means fewer members contesting in each GRC, and more single member constituencies or SMCs. And perhaps most importantly, a constitutional commission headed by the Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon will review aspects of the elected presidency. Already, there has been lively debate about these changes in Parliament as well as outside, especially in the online space. And most of us would have heard about a plant called duckweed, which was made in reference to the NCMP seats uh, by Workers' Party leader Lao Tia Kiang. In response, Government Whip Chan Chun Singh inserted an amendment to the Workers' Party motion to have Daniel Goh take Li Lian's NCMP seat in Parliament. The motion amended the, the amended motion was critical of the Workers' Party's stance on the NCMP scheme, essentially. Now, during times like this, we see the emergence of many political analysts, qualified, unqualified, and some end up being disqualified. <laughs> Plenty of inconvenient questions and your fair share of conspiracy theories. For example, why is the government proposing these changes when they hit a strong home run at the last GE, winning 70% of the popular vote? Why would the ruling party want to amend a system that's clearly worked in their favour? What's the motivation behind the proposed changes to the NCMP scheme? Is it because the government wants to guarantee opposition voices with full voting rights in the highest chamber of the state to institutionalise checks and balances? Or is it a clever way of neutralising the need to vote for the opposition in a general election? Why has the government called for a review, a review of the elected presidency from the criteria for qualifying as a candidate to the election process to the absolute authority of the president where he has discretionary powers. Why now? Why the urgency? Some of these issues were raised in Parliament and the government did address them, yet questions still linger. It is important for us all, the people, the political parties and the government, that we address these questions and doubts in an informed, honest and hopefully reasoned manner. Welcome to the first studio, studio debate of this year's uh, IQ relaunch. I am Vishwas Sadashivan. The topic for today, political reform, what and why. I have three panelists in the studio to help us make sense of the issues. First, we have Dr. Kevin Tan. Kevin is a junk professor at the Faculty of Law, National University of Singapore, and at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at Nanyang Technic Technological University, NTU. A constitutional law scholar, he's written widely on the legal system and on the history and politics of Singapore. Besides, he was a fellow Boy Scout in school with me. <laughs> Right. I think that's your, your greatest honour. Claim to fame. Thank you. Oh, no, I'm not sure about the fame part. Um, I look forward to your expert thoughts on the constitutional dimension of the political reform. Okay. Thank you. Next, uh, we have P.N. Balji, veteran journalist. He hates the word veteran. He's a lot younger than he looks. Uh, with over 30 years on the job, he is former director of the Asia Journalism Fellowship as well as former CEO and editor-in-chief of the Today newspaper. Balji has also held editorial positions in the Straits Times, the new paper in the 80s and 90s. He's no stranger to IQ. Uh, Balji, I, I, I'm sure we can benefit from your incisive, unbiased and substantiated views as a trained journalist. <laughs> we will see. We will see. <laughs> Thank you. Last but certainly not least, Dr. Derek Dakuna an independent scholar and former senior fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies as a political analyst. Actually, he's just an analyst. He analyzes everything. 
Derek has been publicly com commenting on the Singapore elections in the last two decades. In fact, he's been at it since the iconic 1991 general election. Uh, he's actually a lot older than he looks. He's also a returning <laughs> debate IQ panelist. Derek, you have always presented highly analyzed and long-term uh, political implications on such changes, so don't hold back, not this time. We have a studio audience comprising Singaporeans and PRs who are interested in the topic and wish to share their views and seek answers. Thank you for joining us. The discussion is being streamed live, so do call in with your questions on 6516-2003, 6516-2003 or text in via poll everywhere. You'll find the links on our site, www.iq.sg. Okay, let's go to the first question. First question is this. In his speech, PM talked about the need for uh, electoral reform. Among the five core principles, I mean, PM highlighted, I'd like to highlight three, uh, which I think are critical. To keep politics open and contestable, maintaining government accountability, upholding a multiracial society. How much of this do you believe will be achieved, is being achieved, uh, in the proposed changes to the NCMP scheme, the GRC system, uh, and possibly even with the change to the possible changes to the elected presidency, right? Um, yes, Kevin. Well, I think, uh, um, you know, we all got pretty excited when uh, PM was uh, making these announcements. But I think at the end of the day, when you look at what the announcement uh, uh, was uh, was structured around first of all the uh, convening of a constitutional commission to look at only very specific aspects of the elected presidency and of course plans to raise the number of uh, NCMPs from 9 to 12 with full voting rights uh, it seems that this overall uh, relook at the uh, political system is rather limited and I don't think that while it will certainly fit you know some of the key uh, uh, objectives that the PM spelt out, I think is in, in essence a very limited one. So you would have liked to see broader, more fundamental changes? Yes, I would have liked a constitutional commission since we're convening one, uh, first one since, since 1965. Yeah, since convened. That's right, we have convened one since 1960, first one since 65. I would have preferred a a, a, a large-scale overall relook at the political system because if you start tweaking only parts of the political system without looking at the whole, then uh, there's a danger that you, you, you may end up just tweaking certain parts that will then have impacts on others uh, which, uh, you know, w w it's not within the ambit of the Commission's right. uh, inquiry. Right. Thanks. Balji, you've been a journalist for a long time. You would have covered some of these changes that we have seen in the political system. What's your, what's your view on this round of changes? Uh, I, I uh, agree with Kevin. Uh, you know, it is very limited. And as a result, the question I have is why? Mm -hmm. And why now? Mm. Right? So from there, uh, and this is not speculation. I know we don't speculate here. This is not speculation. So because of that question, I'm trying to answer those two questions. You know? Why? What is an urgent need? Mm. My uh, uh, analysis, you know, based on what I know, what I've read, what I've seen, is that this is, these changes are aimed to make it easier for the fourth generation leaders. Let me, let me put it this way. <clears throat> the fourth generation leaders are going to face a major economic challenge. Mm. It's not just economic challenge, I think it's a social challenge. So there are these two major challenges happening in the next few years. I think the political part of it should be should not be a major challenge as far as the PM is concerned. So I think that encompasses the whole thing. Second point is the timing. I think the PM is after the 2011 elections, is a very confident man and he thinks this would be the best time to introduce some of these changes. And to put the pieces in place well before the handover. Before the handover. And the PM has already said in public that uh, he doesn't want to remain after 70 years old. Which, which is means another four years. So four to five years. Yeah. You know? So and, and, and adding on to the, to the leadership issue is we still really don't have a real clue as to who the next PM is, which we never had before. Yeah. We all knew who the second PM will be long before he became PM. We all knew who the third PM will be long before he became the PM. 
Now we don't know who is the fourth PM. So I think that is the context I see these changes in. Right. Thank you. Derek. Okay, I agree with uh, quite a bit of what uh, Kevin and Balji said. Um, I think the main issue is that the handover from Lee Sian Lung to whoever the successor will be seems to be the real issue propelling much of this uh, political reform package. Um, some people have said that they were rather surprised that uh, the government, wa government wants to do some tweaks to the elected presidency. My only surprise is that it actually did not occur far earlier after the 2011 presidential election. In fact, I had expected that they would be making uh, tweaks and making the criteria for eligibility to become candidates in the presidential election election far more austere back then, that it took them so long uh, and only after uh, G2001-5 to broach this issue and to propose it is, is my surprise. Uh, the, uh, the other, the other su uh, surprise is that, uh, a pleasant surprise I would say is the proposed reduction in the size of GRCs mm. and more SMCs. I think that, uh, in all fairness and to achieve, uh, you know, balance, I think that is the one uh, good gesture that the Prime Minister and the PAP is giving uh, to Singapore and to the other opposition parties. In fact, you, you, did, you did say before that uh, one at least a quarter of the total number of uh, wards should be SMCs, right? At least a quarter. Uh, well, I think it has to go back to what uh, the situation was in the 1991 general election, whereby I thought it was uh, the best format in the sense that all the GRCs were uniform in size. There were four member GRCs and there were ample number of SMCs. Yeah. Uh, the 1988 general election, they were all three-member GRCs. It was okay, but I thought moving to four members makes even uh, greater sense N6. because, uh, you know, uh, one one would be an ethnic minority. But so I could have, I I supported I do I'm actually a supporter of GRCs uh, and I supported the, their introduction in 1988. I even supported uh, their expansion for uh, four members in um, the 1991 general election. But after that, when they started to take on different sizes, five members, six members, and then linked up with CDCs and all that, uh, you know, they're changing their role. That was when uh, I uh, felt this is turning into a purely partisan yeah. uh, exercise. Okay, let, let me ask you a specific question, right? Um, on the NCMP scheme, you, you, you have written quite a bit about the NCMP scheme. Uh, you said, and I quote you, you said, the Workers' Party doth protest too much, right? Recently in, in Parliament, uh, Workers' Party leader Lao Tia Kiang described NCMPs as duckweed, yeah. you know, without enough roots on the ground, right? right? Yet, they still have NCMPs uh, from the party. In, in. So this has been criticised, but what is your main issue here when you say they doth protest too much? Well, uh, the very fact of the matter is that it's been shown that the WP has been a beneficiary of uh, the NCMP scheme. Sylvia Lim, uh, <coughs> after the 2006 general election, became, a, became an NCMP and she raised her profile in Parliament and that certainly did help them subsequently when they formed the team to contest in the 2011 uh, election. Uh, and so why I also say that uh, WP doth protest too much, they could have nuanced uh, their protests this way that they could have said that we are satisfied with what we have now in terms of nine NC MPs, okay? But to increase it to 12, what is the purpose? What is the real intention of the government to do that? Uh, I've spoken to other people and some uh, who claim to be in the know 
And there is this real fear. I, I, you, you did suggest not to speculate, but I think <laughs> there must, we have to inject a little bit of speculation here. There is a real fear that in this last election, when the PAP so surprisingly and some would say so shockingly took almost 70% of the popular vote, it did really shock a lot of people within the PAP that they got that uh, yeah. uh, popular vote. Okay, they were expecting they were expecting to lose some electoral divisions, especially to WP, and they d certainly didn't expect to get almost a ten percent sure. swing in their vote. So, so, so what yeah. I am what I'm leading up to is this particular point that they are increasing the. My reading of it is that they want to increase the number of uh, NCMPs to twelve, so as to tell the electorate, look, don't have so much clamor to vote. For the opposition because you will get 12 seats. Be why? Because of the fear that in the next election there will be an overcompensation by the, mm. the voters mm. the other way around. Okay, okay. so they want to diffuse that, okay. I think. On that that's note, the I'd like to throw it open to the floor. Comments doesn't have to pertain to anything that's discussed so far, but comments, if possible, on the NCMP scheme or GRC. Yes, please. If I can just uh, uh, query you on, 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 on your. Uh, uh, observation there. Uh, Prime Minister Lee Sien Lung has been on record uh, many times in the past as being against proportional representation in Singapore. Would you say that uh, this latest scheme or the latest announcement that the government has made is in, in, in effect uh, a de facto form of proportional representation in the sense that these uh, non-constituency members of parliament uh, have not won uh, on, on a first-past-the-post system, but yet will have voting rights. Now, this is a critical point. They will have voting rights. And effectively, it is a recognition by the PAP uh, 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 government that uh, a certain amount of opposition uh, uh, needs to be legitimized in parliament. So is it a de facto uh, uh, sort of thin end of the wedge of PR getting in to Singapore parliament? Uh, shall quick, I answer okay, that? A quick, quick response. I'd like yeah. to hear from the other panelists. In actual fact, I did just comment on that uh, last week uh, in one online post because some people were complaining that you know we should do away with NCMPs and we should just have a proportional representation scheme. So I put it to them that look, uh, why is it uh, so legitimate to have? Uh, someone get into parliament on the basis of a minimum threshold of 20%, for example, for a PR system, mm -hmm. all right? Whereas someone who gets 35% of the vote as a best loser in a first past support system gets in as an M NCMP is less legitimate. It doesn't make sense at all. So that you're quite right. There is some element of uh, PR there. And perhaps I mean, your question could actually be taken to a logical conclusion that they may, they may not stop at 12 after the next election. They might increase it further. And yes, it might be a de facto PR. It's a good point that you raised. Okay. I, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to very quickly go back to another question. Right? I mean, and I think, Kevin, you, you did talk about this before. Um, if you have a presence in Parliament, whether you're elected MP or uh, NCMP, even an MP, right? That presence allows you mm -hmm. to market yourself yes. and to market the party mm -hmm. if you yes. perform well, right? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's an opportunity and it's a five-year opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do very well, even as an NCMP, people may actually vote for you the next time in the election. So mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a very good opportunity for you to stage yourself, mm -hmm. right? What's your view on that? Uh, I, I stand by the same view, and I think, in fact, the, the more uh, the, the other way of looking at what Derek said, which is the, the, the overcompensation, mm -hmm. is to think of the, 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 the PAP in this instance being rather uh, 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 looking rather more forward in time to the day perhaps that they are not, in fact, in power. Now, if they are not, in fact, in power, and if they are among the best losers, with 12 members in the NCMP seats, and maybe a smattering that are duly elected but not forming the government, you can have a coalition mm. and you have enough numbers to take on the ruling party, whoever that might be. 
So it's a bit of an insurance. That too. Very long, very long. Very term long plan. term, right? Uh, Balji? <laughs> yeah, very long time. Very long term, you know. I don't think I'll be around uh, to see that. You know? uh, but the the uh, uh, coming to the uh, NCMP scheme is, is, a, is a similar point that I want to make and that is when it was first introduced, you know, I think a lot of people saw it as a way to tell the public, you don't need to elect yeah. these people. Yes. But I, and that might have been the intention of the government. I, we mm. never know, right? We can't read the go government's mind. But it has actually turned the other way around. You know? It has actually served the uh, opposition quite well. You know? uh, and I think uh, Derek mentioned uh, Sylvia Lim. You know, as a, as if a, they perform uh, well. Uh, if they perform well, yeah. but that's up to them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there is always that, that uh, uh, possibility, right? So I see the NCMP scheme as really now looking back, you know, I don't think I was a, a great fan of the NCMP scheme when it was first introduced, but looking back, I think it has served its purpose. Yes, 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 Michael. Ma yeah. I think we have to be cautious in thinking in the negative what PMD said no propose. I think given the fact that in the 2015 general election, he alone, of all the leaders of political parties, have increased in his popular vote. Mm -hmm. right? Together with the fact that the PP has mastered nearly 70% of the popular vote, I think his, I believe his proposal on political reform comes from a position of strength. Not weakness, it's not defensive at all. It is not like maybe in time the PP is out of power and therefore we are prepared. I don't think those thoughts enter his mind. I think he see the position as the best way. He feel comfortable. Right? So you're saying he was, he's acting more as a statesman. Yeah, statesman, comfortable, and say that look, it benefits the opposition party. When he started, I agree with you. I was with you, Baji, and said, come on, what is this? But I found that it was really an opportunity for potential opposition MPs to shine. Now, if the leaders of opposition party were smart enough, they would try to be the best loser and get in. Right? And therefore, position their parties. Hmm. Okay, so that is important. Right. The NCMP, I think, has now entered a different phase to become almost on par in Parliament, right? To be able to discuss on issues, vote on bills. Equal course, rights, equal rights. Yeah, equal rights. So, hmm. in their mind, if they cannot pass bills, make constitutional amendments and all that, we don't have big issues, constitutional issues hmm. at this point of time. That's important. And for his proposal to increase the SMCs, that to me, I, I, I'm be cautious. Because when you look at the SMC 2015-2011, all the SMCs are contested by Chinese. One race. Okay? To me, political reform must serve to improve inclusiveness and representation. Why? Right? If we increase SMCs, why? Right, I doubt very much any minority will ever get in. Under okay. SMCs. Okay. But if you then confine to a GRCs, right, it might reduce inclusiveness. Right? So I I I, I will cautious about SMCs. Right? Um, okay. okay Michael. Let, no, let's come to that later. Any other views from the audience? I'd like to hear the audience please. Yes. Hi, I would just like to make up on a very specific point which mm. my fellow uh, audience member made on when he said that uh, we don't really have much big constitutional issues in Singapore, right? And that doesn't really matter because of the NCMP scheme. Um, well, I'm, I'm not a constitutional law expert, but I know we have one on the panel today, uh, Professor Kelvin Tan. And But what I understand is Singapore constitution has been changed many, many times in Singapore's short history. Maybe uh, Dr. Tan could enlighten more on that. So based on this fact, although I cannot have the exact figure right now, um, is it really fair to say that we do not have many constitutional uh, questions before us. And I think this is one f um, issue which sort of troubles me, that maybe the population at large in Singapore, they may not be very familiar with the constitution, which is the supreme law of the land, the very basic uh, document on which Singapore is being founded. And we talk about, um, and, and I think, you know, increasing the public's awareness, educating them about constitution, that should be the the cornerstone of our political education, or perhaps you know, we share more 
more conversations about constitution. I mean, we have our Singapore conversation now. We have the future of us dialogue sessions. Sure. Sure. Perhaps one day, you know, we can have a constitutional dialogue um, in Singapore as well. So I'd just like to hear perhaps the expert viewpoints on yeah. the panel. On so, so what you're saying is, is quite similar to what Kevin said at the start, right? Yeah. That we, this particular constitutional review commission, right, uh, has a very narrow mandate. It's just mm -hmm. looking at the elected presidency. Whereas in the 1965 constitutional review, actually looked at the entire spectrum of the constitution and the, the awareness, creating the awareness of and the importance of, constitu of the constitution, that's the point you're making, right? Kevin. Very quickly, uh, 1965, the, the, the remit was actually not as broad as uh, they made it out uh, to be because the remit was actually to look at how to protect minority rights. Mm. But mm. just leveraging on how to protect minority rights, they grew mm. the entire agenda yeah. to look at everything. Yeah. Of course, uh, every single member of that commission were either judges or lawyers. So I, I think they took a very legalistic perspective to this. And they came up with actually a, a, whole, a, a whole raft of very, very good recommendations, most of which were actually rejected by Parliament back in 65. Right. Coming back to your point about number of amendments, we had over 40 amendments to Singapore, Singapore's constitution since 1965. Many of them are actually quite minor, in a sense of uh, you know, minor tweaking. For example, at one time, every time you wanted to change the number of MPs in Parliament, you had to amend the Constitution. Of course, we've taken that out and that pushed it into the Parliamentary Elections Act. So some of these amendments are actually quite small, but um, some of them are actually very, very, very potent, very important. So uh, the ones that we are talking about, the GRC, the ones that, that deal with the electoral system, GRCs, NCMPs, NMPs, elected presidency, and one more that uh, people don't uh, remember very much because it happened in 72, was the entrenchment of Singapore's sovereignty uh, uh, in the constitution, which requires that if we ever surrender sovereignty, let's say you want to merge with mm. Malaysia, Malaysia or somebody else, uh, you would need two-thirds majority at a national referendum. So mm. Parliament can't even make that, that, that decision anymore. So these are the more important among the uh, amendments. Hmm. Can I just raise yes, uh, a, quick one, please. We need to um, a couple of issues regarding the NCMPs uh, since you gentlemen over there raised it. Uh, the, the, the one qualm that I have about uh, uh, the NCMP scheme as we have it now is the stipulation that uh, only two members can be chosen from each GRC. Um, Unfortunately, this gives, does give the impression that the PAP is uh, playing this particular game of divide and, uh, divide and rule. Uh, if, you know, an opposition party like the East Coast uh, GRC uh, uh, team, WP team, uh, had the highest number of votes as the best loser and in the next election and uh, you know then i would suggest that all of them should be entitled to become ncmps and effectively be a shadow team to the pap the elected pap team in that grc but by limiting it to just two from each grc uh, i feel that it's not very sincere on the part of the government uh, uh, on that score. Mm, mm. On a more positive point, however, uh, and looking specifically at what we have now, in actual fact, uh, I would say that the three WP and CMPs, I would suggest, and no disrespect to their predecessors, but I think they are certainly a cut above the last cohort okay. of three. Okay. So that's why I say that the, the WP did. Uh, you know, don't protest too much during the debate. Got it. Can, yes. can I jump in yeah. very quickly yeah. to answer Michael's point and another point yeah. that you made earlier? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think you're, you're very generous to, to the government <laughs> um, because if we look at all the things that they want to change, it sure sounds as if they are afraid to lose something. Okay? Uh, NCMP, okay, may, maybe NCMP is a little bit more vague, but let's look at the reduction in the size of GRCs. They grew the GRCs without hesitation. 1988, 39 GRCs, three members. They grew them to four, and then five and six. And at one point, uh, elections were only contested by five and six member GRCs, no four even. And then suddenly, they began to scale back. After they lost uh, Aljunit in 2011, it pushed 
uh, they already pushed some back in 2006. After 2006, after 2011, they pushed more back into the four member GRC. So now we're left with only two six member GRCs. So what is the what is the concern with this, right? The concern, of course, is that you don't want to lose six at one go. You don't want to lose five at one go. So if two GRCs fall, each one four members, okay, you lose eight. You don't lose twelve, hmm. for example. So that that that, 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 that that's you know, and and and, and coupled with the G, the the elected president, I know we haven't come to that, but the changes that are proposed to the elected presidency to make it more difficult to become president, uh, simply goes back to the fear that the PAP supported uh, candidate uh, may not be the winning candidate okay. in the next round. So that's the elected president. Is there anything else, anyone? Yeah. It's a burning issue that you want to can raise. I, can I just have a reply yeah. there? Short one. You see, the GRC, by reducing the size of GRC, it actually benefits the opposition party because they have difficulties, or there's a belief that they have difficulties getting enough candidates to fill the five members or six members. So if you reduce the GRC to four, more four GRCs, it actually benefit them. So it's not like the government is afraid, you know? But actually, it's trying to encourage participation. I like to see it that way because I do not see Prime Minister Lee making a proposal from a position of weakness or trying to protect the PAP's position for the future. So, right. so your, your point, which, which you made already, is that the Prime Minister in this case was not so much speaking in a partisan view but as a statesman in the yeah. long-term interest of, the, of yes. the country. That's your view, right? You see, the best opportunity now to do constitutional reform politically and to reform this, right? So that people can need not say that, hey, look, you're protecting this, you're trying to change the outcome of the last election and so on. That, that's my view. Okay, yeah. right. Yes. Can, can I hear from some of, the, some of the others who haven't spoken yet first, please? Yes. Okay, uh, this is regarding the fact that um, I think uh, in our education system, um, most of us are, um, are not even aware how our political system works. Like, for example, um, I think... Um, most Singaporeans probably know more about uh, the American Constitution than the Singaporean Constitution, which is weird. <clears throat> and I feel like, um, for example, um, the, the, the thing we're bringing up, proportional representation, um, it's viewed as, I mean, I, I mean, judging from my friend circle at least, uh, most people think that it's a non-issue, that proportional representation has not much tangent with democracy. But w when you look at um, the kind of... Um, policies um, that our ruling government suggests, they're usually, um, let's just put it politely, um, pro-business um, rather than pro-labor. Mm. And I think um, if you had like a more proportional system like in Europe you have, like maybe um, Denmark, similar population as Singapore, similar uh, wealth, you would have a much more um, uh, vibrant democracy and a, a labor movement and, you know, like a much more broader um, economic uh, progress rather than just for the the I, top. I'm not sure I get your point. So My so point is more like uh, why is not uh, why is uh, proportional representation um, not uh, not feasible? Not no, not that. Um, why is it not more um, prominently talked about rather than like well, well, as I a side I, issue? Yeah. yeah. So so your point is basically quite similar to the earlier point made that we all need to discuss constitutional issues at a broader level a lot more and not just narrow policies specifically. Am I correct? Which includes yeah. proportional re representation. Other views, please, before we go on to the elected presidency. Um, sorry, so as we are probably all aware that there are some problems with the Singaporean political system in terms of representation, but do you think with the concessions that the PAP has given, they are trying to sh control the agenda and that they are trying to push only for um, reform rather than complete change because as it is now they are saying that oh, because of the NCMP scheme we now have enough proportional representation of opposition members with the reduction of the GRC sizes or the increase of SMCs we now have a uh, our political system is working fine so do you think that's the objective of the PAP? So, so your point is that they are trying to set the agenda okay. of to for gradual reform rather than a complete change of the political system. Okay. Any other question? Yes, please. Where's the other microphone? Um, 
when we first started just now, you had said that uh, interesting point of view of like how you want to the PAP actually did it so that voters won't jump ship. Uh, it's just a gradual thing that the NCMP was increased so that people will feel a bit more calmer that okay along the years oh there's more people in the uh, opposition so maybe I don't have to vote so many of them in. However, is it maybe is it a possibility that the PAP does this so as to um, force the Workers' Party to show hand? in the sense that, okay, these are our people that over the years, either these guys could actually show themselves to be capable or show themselves to be not incapable of anything. Could this be another tactic? Of well, what? it can work for or against, against, right? Basically, you are there exposed. If you do well, if you perform well, you score. If you don't, you, you don't score, right? Yes? Um, hi. So one of the things regarding why we, um, you know, think about why we're not discussing con large constitutional changes, and in fact, looking at minors, I'm not so sure whether we Singaporeans have not been exposed to political uh, party change already for large landscape changes. Hence, mm. uh, if you notice that that many amendments over the years ha have to seems to be like a very progressive, gradual change, because unlike many other countries in the surrounding regions. I don't think we we are a nation that has been familiar with a change in political party, which might introduce largely different uh, policies that we might be able to address. What do you mean by a change in political party? Like, for example, um, generally in like a lot of the countries where you know um, the the ruling party tends to be different over the mm, elections. I see. Okay. You know, we we are not exposed to that mm. change. So large constitutional change. Uh, you see, I'm talking from the people's, the ground aspect. I don't think they are ready. Perhaps that's the reason why, despite everything, there hasn't been a large call for where are the constitutional changes. What, what you're driving at, and, and from what we are hearing so far, is when you talk about political reform, the expectation is for wider, more fundamental changes as opposed to tweaks. Yes. Am, am I correct? That's what I, I, I seem to be hearing. Uh, Can I answer comment. that question? Yes. yes. Uh, I think you raise a very important point. And in all this discussion, we cannot just focus squarely on the PAP, but look at the other side, the opposition. And your point is so well taken in the sense that look at what is happening in the opposition. We have a very fragmented opposition. And coming out of uh, G2015, uh, to some extent, putting aside the WP, which is, in a w is a totally different category altogether, uh, the state of the opposition is is fairly parlous, okay? And when you talk about policies and why it has to be gradual, the fact of the matter is that no opposition party has been putting up more than half the seats, you know, standing in half the seats in a general election. Once you once an opposition party, whether it's WP, SDP or NSP, feels more than half, feels candidates in more than half of the parliamentary seats, then it is considered and is giving clear indication that it is a government in waiting, an alternative mm. government. And then you can talk about, you know, major changes. Now, when we're talking about itsy-bitsy tweaks and all that, is because, largely because of the fragmented state of the opposition and the very parlous state of the opposition. But Derek, yeah. w would you say that with the expansion of the NCMP scheme, for example, yeah. right, and you suggested that there could be further increase in the number of NCMPs. Could well be, yes. Now, if those changes were to take place, would you say that if the, if the opposition parties in, in Parliament uh, demonstrate their prowess well enough, that we could actually evolve into a, into a two-party or a multi-party system because people have the exposure. Would that happen? Anything is possible and I would say that uh, that could well be the case. But, you know, I don't like to talk in terms of this monolith called opposition. Yeah. I have told people and I'm afraid they don't like my point of view because, uh, uh, you know, they have other uh, alliances and allegiances. I said, in fact, after the 2011 general election, I said that the WP was the only opposition game in town, and it remains the same today after the 2015 general okay. election. It's, look, Singapore is so small a place that we really cannot afford 
at the most generous estimate, I would say, as an analyst following this, these things for so many years, more than three political parties, including the PAP. Ideally, if you ask me, with such a small territory and relatively small population, and you know, the population, the small population also includes a large number of foreign nationals. Mm, so mm. it's even smaller when you're talking about the voter base, the electorate. Yep. That, you know, we can really only afford two parties and it's really the PAP. And in my point of view, and as I say, a lot of people don't like this, but uh, tough luck, I have to say it. It's, it's the I'm other party, the WP. That's yep. why I say... WP doth protest too much is going to be the beneficiary of some of these changes, whether it's NCMPs okay. or smaller size got GRCs. You got your point? Yes. Two, two more points and then we move on to elected presidency. Yes. I would just like to respond to what uh, the, uh, Dr. just mentioned. Uh, so, based on what he's saying, he said that oh, we don't have much massive political change in Singapore because we have a rather fragmented opposition. Right, they hasn't put out a lot of candidates for election. But I think this assumes that you can only initiate political change through parliament, that you have to be a politician in order to initiate political change. So why can't we initiate political change as a citizen through civil society, for example? Okay. Yes, sir. I just want to take on Derek's point that there is not enough space for more than two uh, mm. serious political parties. Two or in three, he said. Two yeah. or three mm. serious parties in Singapore. Now, I I would argue that there is actually space for a strong PAP. Work Workers' Party is there, and there is space for one more party. I'm not saying the SDP is a natural party, but there is space in any democracy. Now, if we have three strong parties, maybe not three equally strong parties, a very strong PAP and two good opposition parties. WP is already there. If the SDP can win about 30 to 35 percent of the votes, then we can consider them to be a serious contender. So any party in a, in a, in a democracy which three strong parties, a party which wins 40 percent of the votes is going to form the government. And I don't see what is wrong with, you know, for us to have, you know, actually three strong parties. But for that to happen, we, we need other changes, not just changes initiated by the government. For example, we need to have a press, you know, which is decent enough for a country which is 50 years old. We can't just rely on one newspaper telling us how to think, what to think. So I think that's not fair to us, is it? And there is a real fear in the PAP of, you know, that they know what's best. Not only that, they, they even feel that they have this responsibility to, to provide an acceptable opposition. So, the way I see the NCMP is like, they, they are telling you, you know, okay, I'm going to give you three more NCMPs, you know, and that should satisfy your desire. I, I don't agree. Okay, so it's, it's similar to the earlier point about setting the agenda, right? Or, yes. Uh, small point, small point. Yes, yes, yes. Um, this is regarding, uh, this is a question at um, Dr. Kelvin. Um, there, isn't there a historical reason for the fact that our opposition is very fragmented? And I would like to hear a little bit from you. Historical? Historical. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Historical and structural. There are, there are two things. First of all, uh, uh, the PAP itself had split earlier, 1961, Barisan Socialists. Um, Barisan Socialists had 13 members after 1963, the general election, but decided in keeping with the Cultural Revolution to abandon Parliament altogether. So all of them started resigning, two of them fled because they were wanted under the ISA, and so uh, it basically abdicated the Parliament to the PAP. That's, that's, that's the historical yeah. fact. The other point is that in politics in Singapore, you will notice that there is actually no ideology that divides the parties. And when you don't have an ideology, you're not very strong. You're not, you know, as you pointed out earlier, pro-labor, pro-business. Actually, the PAP is all things to all seasons, or, or for all, all persons. You, you, you call them capitalists, they are capitalists. Pragmatic, they are, not ide yeah. ideology-based. And, and, hold on, hold on. Just, yeah, and so, so and, and, and as a result, to be the opposition is extremely difficult. And that's why, in a sense, I agree with Derek, because what is the Workers' Party? How different is the Workers' Party from the PAP? Mm -hmm. 
think about it. Yeah, in terms of manifesto and, and your, your ideology. Yes, Michael, I, I quick think, one. I think there's a... Uh, 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 mi please. Microphone, microphone, yeah, please. Yeah. I, I think many Singaporeans do not know that we actually have more than 10 political parties registered. Mm -hmm. I think closer to... More than 20. More than, more than 20. 20 now, huh? okay. So but, it is not that there's a lack of political parties, right? But I think there's a lack of deep issues that split society, right? That will then for men or develop the opposition, right? And there's a lack of leadership quality, leadership material that can then challenge. We have, we have really many people in the blocks, you know, they make very good points, but politics is a contact spot, right? You can make a lot of points in the block and then if you don't come out and stand, who cares about what you write about, you know? Okay, I, I, need, I need to hold it there. We are, this topic today is not about <laughs> party politics. Huh? Yeah. Uh, we, I'd really like to bring the discussion back to the kind of reform that we're talking about, uh, the NCMP scheme, we talked about the GRC. I think it's time now to move on to something that I think a lot more people are interested in, concerned about, uh, have a lot of questions about, the elected presidency. Right? Now, um, there are some changes that have been suggested, right? The, the Constitutional Review Commission that's, uh, that's going to be, that's chaired by the Chief Justice, Sundaresh Manan, right? Uh, is, has been asked specifically to look at changes to the criteria for candidates, selecting, qualifying candidates, looking at the powers of the Council of Presidential Advisors, right? And also about looking at the discretionary rights and powers of the elected president. Right? Now, when you look at this, there are various questions that are coming up. Why now? Why at this point in time? The presidential election has to be conducted, has to be done by August next year, 2017. Right? And the commission report is expected by the third quarter of this year. And it's going to impact on the next presidential election. The Prime Minister has made it clear that the, the voting system, the, the, he is going to be elected. The first question I have is, does that mean that it's going to be a popular vote election or an electoral college of sorts? You know, you know whether it should be popular vote or electoral college. Now, Kishore Mahubani, Professor Kishore Mahubani, Mahubani made this comment. He said, um, it is true that our elected presidency does not allow the president to open the coffers with a single key. Yet the election of a figure who is opposed to the responsible government in power can create painful political tensions. There is wisdom in Singapore choosing presidents through parliament. This will enable us to choose them on the basis of merit and not popularity. This is what Kishore Mahubani has said. In other words, he is advocating that actually instead of a popular vote, the president could be elected by parliament, a college, right? Uh, Bertha Hansen made this comment. It is not politically correct to say the people are dumb. Now people are too dumb to know that the EP elected president they pick might be bad for them. So there must be a way to ensure that the right people are elected better still not have an election at all, right? So there are clearly opposing views on this. I mean, if you, if you want legitimacy, then you need to have some form of a popular vote. Mm -hmm. But if your focus is on merit and quality of the president and so on, then clearly you'll move towards what Kishore is talking about, which is, you know, a more controlled way of electing the president. Right. I'd like us to quickly talk about this. This is important because it has to do with the legitimacy of the president's office. Very good. Maybe, uh, we haven't yeah, heard from right, our, Balji, yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, Balji first. No, um, my, my 1991, right? We had yeah. the first elected presidency. 93, 91 was the amendment. 93, amendment. Oh, 93, 93, 93 was the amendment. 93. Was the, uh, to the elections. What, in what way has that... What's wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with that system that mm. we have elected a president that we now need to relook there? One reason given is that well, we don't want to politicize the elected presidency. But it has already been politicized, right? If you look at the first elected president, a contest was manufactured mm. 
to make sure that there was a contest. You know? I mean, I, I presume that that kind of a contest, a manufactured contest can only happen in Singapore, right? So I, I'm looking at all the four, the presidents that we have had, there has been no problem. So why is there a need now to go back to appointing a president? I think that's the first point. I don't think they are appointing yeah, a president. No, no, I'm talking about what Kishore, Kishore and, uh, yeah. and Bertha have said. Well, it's still so, election. Sorry? It's still it, it, election. But yeah, election by whom? Yeah. Not, a right? not a mass base. Not, yeah. not a popular. Yeah. So, yeah. No, no, no. Popular. my point is, has it worked or not? Hmm. As far as I know, I think it has worked. So why go and change the system? That's my point. Yeah. The Economist magazine did ask that question. I mean, why, why rock the, why change yeah, the why, system why, that's why? working? So, so then, again, if this is not speculation. I come to the point that could it all be because of what happened in the last election? Okay, you're talking. If the last election, in specific terms, you're talking about the punching book factor, right? Not just punching book factor, but I think that it was a, a heavily contested mm, election. Mm, mm. There were four people who fought, and the Dr. Tony Tan just scraped through. It was a real scare. So was it intended? with that in mind. You will never know. Never. We will never know. I can't read the Prime Minister's mind, you know. But when you are faced with this, one, that the, 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 the President has served well, as far as we know. Uh, second, that this election happened where there was a scare for the ruling party candidate. So could this now be all done in, in uh, reaction to that? Quick question. Do you believe it is fundamental that the elected president, given his responsibilities, which is different from what it yep. used to be, right, should be elected on the basis of a popular vote? I believe so. Okay. Constitutional expert? I, I think that it is not necessary. I think, I think uh, we, we let's, let's separate the object of what the EP was supposed to do with the office. If you are looking for a second key, would you entrust the second key to one individual or to a group of individuals? Now, if you say that you perhaps might trust a group as opposed to one individual, then why don't we have an alternative system where, for example, we can have an upper house? A bicameral system. Bicameral system, mm. right? No, you don't have powers of initiation, but you have certain delay powers, right? So instead of blocking, like the president can, you might have some delay powers, and those members can be elected to hold the second key. So then you can turn your elected president or the president back into the nominated role that he had served for a long time, whereby he can then act as the symbol of Singapore, multi-ethnicity, multi-racialism, and then you can do the rotation among the various ethnic uh, groups and so on and so forth. So th there, is, there is therefore, you know, uh, I think a, a, a flawed assumption that if you want a second key, it must be held by the elected president. Right. Now, Derek, you, you had made a comment in one of your, yeah. uh, uh, one of your articles uh, saying that the president's office has a certain dignity. Yeah. Right? Has a certain dignity. And we should not lose that dignity because he is a unifier of the nation, of mm. the people. Would you want to elaborate on that? Because it, it is linked to this whole thing about legitimacy and the object of the EP and the role the President plays. Uh, absolutely. And I think we have to put things in context. Uh, the whole discussion now seems to be uh, skewed in one direction, uh, as though the selected President uh, you know, is going to spend most of his time uh, vetoing the government's drawdown on reserves or you know, not agreeing to civil, uh, appointments, uh, senior civil service appointments and all that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the president, uh, whether it was a, uh, whether it's the elected president or what it was previously, much of the functions are ceremonial functions. Okay, uh, attending to uh, various uh, re receiving various dignitaries and also essentially being Singapore's diplomat in chief when he goes abroad uh, to uh, keep up relations and ties between Singapore and other countries. So I think a lot of that uh, 
is really part of the president's functions, even in the elected presidency scheme that we have now. So I think we have to put that in a particular context. And that's why I, f I feel that uh, we have to have a certain dignity when we choose um, the president. What I uh, was rather uh, appalled at the, the last election back in uh, August 2011 was there the, I mean, you may not like the particular individuals, but on the nomination day, one of them being barracked, uh, organized barracking by some uh, people in, in the crowd. Uh, I, I, I mean, I felt very uncomfortable mm, that mm. Uh, I think that even in the entire, in, entire process of electing the president, it goes back to 1993 when you had Ong Teng Chong and yep. Chua Kim Yao. That one was a campaign that uh, I ca cannot even use the word fought, but that, yeah. that, that was a campaign that was you know, uh, carried out with a great deal of decorum and uh, dignity. And yet, Mr. Chua still was able to surmount the 40% uh, tile threshold. He got more than 41% of the vote to Ong Teng Chong's 58 point something right. percent of the vote. And it goes to a point that, uh, Bishwa, you will remember that uh, in a previous IQ uh, forum here, I said that uh, presidential election and by-elections uh, have mm. all become occasions for Singaporeans to cast a protest vote against the ruling party. Now, do you all want that to be the case? That. Uh, a segment, an increasing segment of Singaporeans view that as an occasion to essentially poke an eye in, uh, in the government because they are un unhappy about something or to put the government or uh, keep the government on its toes knowing sure. full well that they cannot displace the government. Okay. So I, I get your point. Can, can, can we now hear from the audience? Anything pertaining to the elected presidency, right? Can we, can we hear from some of the others who have not said anything so far? Those in the middle, behind? I think I tend to agree. It kind of becomes a midterm referendum on the government if we have an elected contest. The presidential election will actually be turned into something like a, a mini referendum on the government's performance. So perhaps this is one way the government, they don't want that outcome, is it? Because it shouldn't be a, a referendum on the government's performance. It's very clearly an election for the president, is it? But hmm. it can be turned around, I mean, if they don't do anything. I think that's my way. So what do you think the intention is when you say they don't do anything? So what is it you think... Oh, I think the, the intention and there is a real threat that the so-called uh, government uh, supported candidate can actually lose next year. I think there is a real threat okay. and That's they don't it. want That's such an outcome. I okay. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, one of the questions that when, when PM made the announcement was bugging me was where there is a council of president advisors who needs to be consulted mm -hmm. and I think it's it's kind of mandatory in a certain ways. Mm. On a lot of discretionary powers, uh, what difference does it make if this president was appointed or elected? Exactly. Really, what difference is it going to make? So I think, I think it's, it's an important point you're making. The Council of Presidential Advisors, right? The nine of them com yes. com com comprises nine individuals, right? No, six. Uh, six? six? No, but they're two alternates. Uh, alternate, yeah. Alternates. Okay. So, so all together, you know. Uh, and it's chaired by Mr. J.Y. Pillay. Right? Yes. Now, the, the one of the suggestions is to examine whether the powers of the CPA or the Council of Presidential Advisors could be enhanced. Or strengthened. Strengthened in fact, or enhanced, actually. right? So, um, Kevin, what's the implication of this? Well, first off, um, Council of Presidential Advisors are not elected, they are appointed. Exactly. And the big problem, of course, is that if you keep giving these um, uh, more power, to a bunch of unelected persons than the person you've elected. I think there's, there's a, a real incongruence and a real problem on your hands. So, so right you're going you're gonna, to you're, you're gonna, you know, lose legitimacy in that sense. So legitimacy comes with popular vote. Yes. Right? And that's the elected president. He 
right now what it says is where he has to exercise his discretionary powers pertaining to financial bills, pertaining to the use of reserves, right? Uh, he is obliged to take advice from the CPA. But he can, he's obliged to take advice, but he doesn't need to heed the advice, right? Now, if he goes against the advice of the CPA, yes. he can go to Parliament yeah. and Parliament can actually override, override yep. with a two-thirds majority. Yeah. Exactly. Am I correct? That's right. Yes. Exactly. Now, mm. Is that likely to change? Is that likely to change? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I, I think... Would other non-discretionary powers become also be included in this category? You see, this is where it is getting really, really funny, right? Because uh, when they, when Lee Kuan Yew came out with the EP scheme, in fact, uh, back in 1984, yeah. one has to track it back all the way to Ensign by-election. Yeah. Fear of freak results. So how do you manage your freak results? Two things came about. NCMP scheme, first one, and then floating the trial balloon over the elected presidency. Yeah. In other words, there's a fear that if, a very irrational fear, but a fear nonetheless, that if the PAP loses power, you want a, a PAP-like person sitting in the Istana blocking these you know, profligate opposition fellows, right? So, so you, they, they had only one scenario in mind, right? In other words, the, the elected presidency, the presidency will be occupied by a person like them. But then, when you, you but you can't say that, right? So you cast the the, 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 the requirements and make it very difficult, thinking that only PAP like type of persons, pro establishment people of that ilk, can make it there. So now, with the possible strengthening of the CPA, yeah, anyone who is who comes in who is not PAP like <laughs> would be forced to become, yeah. So, so you've right, got because of the CPA <laughs> needing to follow the CPA. Right. So the president is supposed to check on Parliament, and now you want somebody to check on the president. I think okay. that is exactly the point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, I yes. I think the uh, it's timely again because the elected president is the least developed of our political system. But he has, he has worked so far, but he has not started the work. Right? It's there. We have presidents and all that. They, they carry out their ceremonial function. But they have not unlocked reserves. I, at least I couldn't remember. They Correct have. Me if I'm yes, wrong. yes. They have once. They have once. 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 Mm -hmm. More token, symbolic. No, it's no, not. No, no, no. It's not not token. Token. It's After not 2008 token. Uh, financial token. crisis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not once. token. Yes. Resilience yeah. package, quite yes. seriously. Yes. 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 Yeah, but once. Once. Yeah, well, once. Not yeah. like, well, you know, we are welfare scheme. Let's give people this money, rich, and all that. It's not like that. So you, you try once, it's a try run, okay? Try run, everybody is there. It is not like looking for a person who is like us, pro PAP. I think it's more like looking for somebody who is pro Singapore. Because the reserve actually belongs <coughs> to Singapore, Singaporeans, you know? So it is not that. But I think in the reform bill, more things have to be written in, for example, that the elected president must have access to the documents that shows the full extent of Singapore assets and all that that the elected president may even be allowed a uh, room to consult other people than the CPA, right? And so on. So all these things can come in and say, look, the elected president, if he has a mandate of the popular vote, popular vote, not electoral college, but popular vote, he can call for these resources. And there are enough people, independent people out there who say, come in, I can give advice. Okay, but, the, okay. but, the, but the, the truth of the matter is the constitution does prescribe the yeah. The, yeah. the powers or the lack of powers yeah. of the elected president. And you can't go beyond that. And by the way, there's nothing stopping the president from consulting people outside the CPA. It's just that he is required to consult the P CPA. That's the only difference. Correct. So in a, in a reform, in the efforts for the reform, some of these things can be changed. So it, it is limited. It need not be that because we are having reform. Let's turn the whole thing over. You know, let's, let's yeah, renovate yeah, okay. the entire yeah. political system. Yeah. I, I'm not for sorry, it. Sorry, Michael, yeah. but here, here the um, three areas were specif specified. Right. And it, this has nothing to do with the stuff that you've suggested, yeah. right? You know, keep the eligibility criteria up to date. What does that mean? Make it harder, right? Probably. Because mm. in the midst of that speech, he came up with this 2,000 over companies that are over more than 100 million paid up capital. So suddenly your pool has grown from maybe two to 300. 
1993 right up to two plus thousand now. That's that's one. Two, strengthening the CPA. We've talked about that. And the last one, ensuring that minorities have a chance to be elected. Right? This is something we haven't touched on uh, at, at the moment. But this is fundamentally inconsistent with the idea of competition. Of course, if your stars are aligned, your minority candidate is also the best candidate. And then there's no issue there. Why should the EP be competitive? It is. Right now, it is competitive. I mean, you can elect. All right, we, we need to go to the next question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is regarding uh, the fact that um, the PAP uh, presents the office of the president as um, sort of like, you know, like a second key to protect and like a check on the rogue government. Don't you think this shows like um, a contempt of democracy? And also with regards to that, there was our president, Ong Teng Cheong, who uh, sanctioned a strike and he was marginalized by the ruling party, although he was from the ruling party. What is your opinion about this? Okay, uh, I'm not sure about sanctioning the strike, but yeah. uh, maybe we go to the journalist. Uh, Malji? Yeah. Well, what's your question, whether? Um, why uh, the ruling party seems to have such a contempt for democracy when it comes to offices of, um, in, in, of government that are more... Um, uh, more... Um, Resonate to like popular um, because of purpose vote, is to yeah. Check rogue government. Yeah. So yeah. Rogue why, gov why why is everybody a rogue, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> check a possible rogue government, right? Yeah, I mean, why yeah. use the word <laughs> rogue government? You don't yeah. hear any other government that, using that. That one you should ask Lee Kuan Yew. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you have a direct <laughs> line to him, please please ask. Him. <laughs> yes, Derek. I think in all this discussion, uh, we we ought to re remember one thing that. Uh, as Michael did mention early on, uh, that uh, the government is introducing these changes from a position of strength, coming out of the G2015 with a, uh, a massive mandate. Okay, so, uh, and in the ultimate analysis, when you have that kind of mandate, effectively, you ask yourself this question, does the PAP have the legal authority to do all the things that it wants to do uh, with regard to the elected presidency. Second, does the PAP have the moral authority to do what it wants to do in terms of changes to the elected presidency? Now, on both counts, if you base everything from what the PAP received in G2015, uh, the answer is completely in the affirmative. Emphatically, yes, they have both the legal authority and complete moral authority to, uh, to make these changes. If, if just you know, a, a hypothetical uh, issue, the WP had gained seats and the PAP uh, did not uh, uh, you know, receive a 10% swing of the popular vote, uh, but it was far less than that. And in fact, there was some speculation amongst PAP insiders that they were fearing a drop in their, of their vote to below 60%. If that occurred, then I would say the PAP would have the legal authority but no moral authority. And then that becomes a real, real issue that we have to... Uh, okay. uh, legitimate questions arise. Right. I've got a question from a caller from outside. Can we have the caller now, please? Yes. Speak up. We can hear you. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. This is Mark. Yes. Hi. Thank you for calling, taking my call. <laughs> okay. What's your name? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we my can hear you. You are Mark. 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 Yes. Yes, Mark. Yes. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, I, I just want to ask a question. Um, uh, with regards to um, the national referendums, um, uh, how likely is this for the Constitutional Commission on the elected presidency to call for a national referendum? Should there be one? Why or why not? Should there be a, a referendum? I mean, whether the Commission should would recommend uh, or would, as part of the process, require a referendum? I, I, I'm not understanding your question. Uh, should there be a national referendum on the uh, political changes? Mm. Ah, should there be? Uh, okay. On, so not just the elected presidency, but all the proposed political changes or just the elected presidency? Because you yeah, consider all, all that... All of them, all of them. Okay. Kevin. 
Okay, first of all, uh, I think in, in very few societies do you require referenda yeah. for all constitutional amendments. This would be unworkable. Uh, you, you, the idea behind constitutions is that you want to make this law a little bit harder to amend than most ordinary laws. And so normally you would require something like a two-thirds majority vote. That said, I think if you are going to put into the constitution, and this is a debate which we had back in 1988 when they were mm -hmm. talking about the elected presidency, if you are going to entrench an office so tightly that you would only be removable by a referendum, it would stand to reason. Stand only to reason. Eh? This is just it's not a particular sure. uh, legal argument. Eh? It's a political argument. You stand to reason that you should ask the people if they want to embed it so tightly in the constitution. right? Because once you put it in, you can't take it out. And uh, the, the, the interesting thing, of course, is that the amendments to the uh, elected president's powers and his powers of blocking amendments to his own powers have remained in abeyance since 1991. In other words, this is the 25th anniversary of constitutional provisions, namely in Article 5 and 5.2a, that remain not yet in force. I know of no law in any country that's been held in abeyance for 25 years. So do you feel that there is a need for some form of a national referendum in the case of the constitutional review. Not, not well. It, it's not very difficult for for this, for this particular for this, yeah. set of amendments. That's, that's a question. But, but I would have said that in relation to the EP, we should have had a national we referendum. We should have had. Okay. We should have. But had. now that you're reviewing, but a bit them, too late, right? Yeah. But now that you're reviewing, mm. uh, could you do it post? Oh, certainly, certainly. Right. Uh, you, all you need to do is to pass a referendum act, and then uh, you, you you carry out the referendum. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, caller. Thank you, Ma. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, yes. Can Mike. we pass the mic behind, please? Uh, just talking about the uh, elected presidency. Uh, uh, I think uh, the, the the elected presidency, as it is defined at the moment, is uh, there is a fundamental uh, uh, problem with it, in the sense that uh, the responsibilities and the and the the task that the elected presidency has to discharge is fundamentally, in my view, uh, beyond the abilities of one individual for the simple reason that the decisions that he has to take uh, uh, and when he has to take those decisions are going to be uh, momentous. For instance, uh, after the last financial crisis, 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis, when President Nathan uh, was asked to release $5 billion, and he sanctioned it. Uh, it was a momentous decision. I mean, $5 billion for an individual uh, without uh, financial training or without supporting staff. I think somebody made the point that he needs uh, other advisors. It's, it's a tremendous decision. Uh, and then fundamentally, I don't think it is uh, fair or uh, uh, correct uh, to vest all that power in one individual. And I think Professor Tan's uh, suggestion of a, that the office of house. president should be replaced uh, and house. perhaps the uh, Council of Presidential Advisors merged into an upper house mm. uh, has a lot of merit. In addition to the Council of Presidential Advisors, we also have a Council uh, of, for religious, religious Harmony, mm. if I'm yeah. not mistaken, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which is also an unelected body with considerable powers. Now, all this could be merged into an upper house. Exactly. Because at the moment, the elected president, I'm not sure uh, uh, whether the elected president is obliged to take the advice of the Council of Presidential Advisors. But if he's obliged to take the advice, no. then uh, we have a case of an elected per, uh, office being checked by unelected individuals. He's not obliged. So he's, he's obliged to take, but he need not heed. And when he doesn't heed the advice, it can be reversed by parliament with a two-thirds majority. With a two-thirds majority. Yeah. So that's how it stands. Right? Yes. Uh, so so your, your point really is that a lot, I mean, we are trying to enmesh larger we responsibilities have, put, into one person. We put far too much responsibility right. on one individual, right. which uh, perhaps it might be, unless you have an outstanding indiv individual like uh, Mr. J.Y. Pillay, who's financially yeah. trained. Yeah. Uh, but for most average people, uh, it is a lot to ask, yeah. and, and even therefore for, it even would be better to have Pillay, a group. I believe, <laughs> even for J.Y. Pillay. Uh, but but um, 
I don't think that's the remit of the uh, Constitutional Review Commission. It's very, it's very narrow. Mm -hmm. It is not to question whether or not to have <coughs> the elected president's office, but to how he is going to be elected and what kind of powers he has. We have five minutes left. I'd like to ask one final question to all of us. Right. Um, the criteria is one, the criteria for qualifying candidates is also going to be reviewed by the commission. Right? Now, it has been, some people are saying that one of the things that, uh, in, fact, uh, in fact, the Prime Minister did intimate, did, did, did suggest in his, in his speech that uh, times have changed. $100 million is not what it used to be. Companies are much larger. Uh, essentially, I think what is being referred to here is one of the criteria is that uh, the qualifying candidate should have managed either as chairman or CEO a $100 million paid-up capital entity or a government ministry or a stat board. Right. Now, what are the chances of that actually being pushed up to, say, $500 million? And if that happens, what's the implication for the elected <coughs> presidency and, and, the, and the whole election? I mean, <coughs> the, the chances of it being increased are very, very high. That's quite obvious from what the PM said. But whether it goes up to 500 million or 1 billion, uh, that we will never know, right? No, automatically but what are the implications, yeah. right, you ask? Is it, yeah, if, if we were to take that argument that, that you need to push it up to 500 million, first of all, is it a valid argument? Do, does the elected president really need to be someone who has run a company or an organization with a paid up capital of 500 million? Is it necessary, you know, based on what we just talked about? Is it necessary? Views? Yes. OK, it seems like as though the taking point from the American politicians is happening right now, right? Where you have to have a certain money like, as a credibility issue. I feel that for a president to be elected, it does not mean that you need to have manage a big company because you have CPAs to give you very good advice and you can get other people to give you advice. So. I do not know where they're coming from when they have that 100 million or maybe 500 million managing assets. I feel that a president needs to be best representing Singapore and international level and Singaporeans themselves. And I also feel that we are too small of a country to be divided on issues which are issues for bigger nations. Mm. Because we are too tiny to even th you know, to be divided on this issue. And I feel that there are better uh, positive act in actually collaborating with each other and finding solutions to grow as a nation together than being divided by parties. What, what would you say would be perhaps the most important quality that we want to see in the elected president in a candidate for the elected presidency, what's the, what's the most important quality that you want to see in that person, you know? And uh, and do we find it? Is it too difficult to find that quality, given that he has certain responsibilities? Can we can we have a spectrum of views on that? Can Your I view, start with yeah. That? Okay. So as I was saying, to be the ambassador of the country, right? It's like the chief ambassador. So that with any like previous, perhaps previous contributions that they have done on international platform, that would be a criteria. So that it I need look not into. be economics based. Because they, say, don't, but, need, they but, don't need to. But common sense. Correct. To be able to evaluate the advice given by others, right, with specialized knowledge. Others. Yeah. Um, I think if you need your president to be just a face that represents, you don't need an economic background. But if you would like a, a president who has certain, certain um, sense as well as certain intelligence as well as certain capabilities to handle that kind of coffers and everything clearly at least I would like to have someone who has experience in managing it otherwise apart from dignity credibility is at issue so I guess that's one angle. well I mean actually Mr. Asar Nathan didn't have that yes. much of experience and hence, running I think a, a company you know I mean he but ran a see, ministry the time he was and now and I the think chairman of the landscape hmm? so the chairman chairman of SPH, yeah. Yeah. I think like in most people you want to look at competency, and I think 100 million is okay. You know, 
would like to say he has experienced managing that, but that's not it. It may not even be sufficient, it may not even be necessary. But I think he must be a person of dignity, impeccable, fearless integrity, right? Which means he must be given some powers that in the event he gets into a quarrel with government, he has the power to call for a referendum, you know, in that event, right? When there's a clash. Yeah. So, so the person must have fearless integrity. That when he has a clash, he can take up to the people and say, look, right? The government is going to spend so much money, do you agree? Okay, somehow I don't know how you draft it into the constitution, mm. right? But I think that is more important. But he has economic advices, right? You don't need to increase it to 500 million. Being able to manage 500 million and manage 100 million, what's the difference? Right. right. Okay, thank you. Any other views on the qualities? Yes? I do think that Singaporeans over the, the last few years, especially uh, President Tony Tan, has felt a series of dissatisfaction in the sense that they don't that he doesn't represent anything that we wanted anyway, and it was either him or someone else. So we had, okay, that guy, kind of thing. And I mean, we've heard so many jokes, you know, Colonel Sanders and okay. this and that. But at the end of the day, I guess it's the idea of that we want someone that we can trust with and humility that has touched, that has the grassroots towards the people. And I, I don't know how these changes are going to impact that. Because at the end of the day, yes, he does have the economic, uh, has the economic sense. But if he does not represent what the people want, or even the candidates that people want, and he does not say, I can earn 100, I can manage 100 million company, then how do we even choose that person to vote for in the first place? Right. So I guess it goes back to, let's, let's wind up the discussion. Uh, let's, it goes back to what you said, Derek, that what's the role of the president, whether it's elected or not, right? As you said, a person who unifies the nation. Absolutely. And Would you want to comment? To have a great deal of dignity. Uh, but to comment specifically on the questions or the, the, the remarks that, uh, uh, that were made, and uh, uh, this was uh, point as to whether the criteria will be raised in terms of uh, a person who had managed a company with five hundred paid, paid up capital of five hundred million dollars and all that. The the interesting point here is that the Prime Minister did tell us that uh, they would like to give ethnic minorities a chance. So how do you square the circle between trying to get ethnic minorities to have a chance to become president and the uh, you know enhancing the criteria? It might be a very difficult uh, thing for them uh, uh, to achieve. So this this is something that uh, that we have to uh, deal with. The other point that I want to raise is, I do feel that this uh, issue that was uh, brought up that somehow we must give ethnic minorities uh, an opportunity. I, as an ethnic minority Singaporean, don't feel very strongly about it and. In fact, uh, it's a bit insulting uh, from my point of view because I've, n I've not found any of the presidents that we've had since Yusuf bin uh, Ishak onwards uh, uh, having any problems with uh, subscribing to a multiracial Singapore, a multicultural Singapore, a multilingual Singapore, a multireligious Singapore. They've been absolutely exemplary, all of the presidents. So to me, that is not an issue. I don't care whether the person is Chinese, Malay, Indian, whatever. Uh, and uh, to, to me, um, I would prefer that the Constitutional Commission doesn't you know, spend so much time dealing with that particular mm. aspect of mm. the, uh, the ter terms of reference. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Balji. <laughs> uh, we, we didn't have a lot of time to discuss about the uh, the minority representation mm, yeah. uh, in, the, in the elected presidency. In the elected yeah. presidency, and uh, I think that to me is the most controversial, if, if not most important decision you know, for the elected presidency. Uh, like uh, Derek, I'm against it. Uh, I think uh, it, in a sense, dilutes the elected presidency because the elected presidency is a person who should be saving. I mean, who should be safeguarding our reserves. He should be impeccable character. You know? He should be looking at Singaporeans and the, and the safety of Singaporeans and the prosperity of Singaporeans and the welfare of Singaporeans. And above race. And he should be above race. So why bring in this at all? You know? That's a, 
un the answer that I don't have at all. Thank you. Kevin. Um, difficult to square the circle, I you think. You are a minority here. <laughs> yes, exactly. I am a minority. <laughs> um, I, I think here, here, here I, I repeat what I said earlier. Um, let's have a nominated uh, president. Uh, why? Because I cannot put into any kind of contestation criteria dignity. I mean, how do you compete on dignity? It's just, just not possible, right? So if you want to looking for those kinds of qualities, unifying factor, personality, nomination is the only way to go. Put the CPA together with you know, other members up in the upper house. Upper house. Now, if, th if this is out of the equation, which it probably is, then I'll try and square the circle which um, Derek su su suggested. We do it the GRC style. You don't have one president running for election. You have three in a team. One Chinese, one Malay, and one Indian or other. <laughs> then you forgot the Eurasian. <laughs> no, or other, or other, or other, or other. Yeah. And then, uh, I, I hate this, this phrase, but it's, it's official, right? So, you, you, so then you win and you go into, you go into the Istana, right? And you take turns to be the president. So six year term, each one do three years. Each one do two years. The other two, since the president is entitled to appoint two members in the CPA, two of them go into the CPA. When the president's away, one of them who is the chairman of CPA stands in as the president and you do a rotation. Okay, and you can then... Can I veto that? <laughs> 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 well, you know, I, I, think, I think that's an interesting way to end this discussion. Uh, at, at the end of the day, when we look at political reform, and that's where we started, political reform, and in the president's speech in the opening of parliament, he talked about the need to reform and to keep moving with the times. And I think nobody would argue with the need for us to move with the times. Right? And the question is, are the changes that we are seeing really about moving with the times? Or are we anticipating too much and try to try and, try and plug the holes and in the process create a very complicated system because we are trying to achieve too many things out of one thing, right? Uh, as we said just now, as was, as was discussed, you know, the president's office, he is required to do so many things. He is required to be the unifier, which requires a different set of qualities. And then at the same time, he should be a mi ethnic minority. Right? And then you need also need someone with economic or financial knowledge. It's very hard to find one person fulfilling all these criteria. Right. So when we talk about political reform, it is not just about looking at things that are already there and tweaking them. I believe political reform may require us to go back to fundamental building blocks of what we are as a nation, as a society, looking at the constitution and even at the primacy of the constitution. Anything that is amendable by a two-thirds majority in parliament, in my view, cannot continue to have primacy, to be the primary document that governs the society. There, these are fundamental issues that we need to look at, right? Do we, should we have a Bill of Rights of sorts, which is unamendable? For me, that's what constitutional reform, that's what political reform should at some point, maybe not now, but at some point, we need to look at it. I get a sense from listening to some of the younger members in the audience that you'd like to see some of those changes that are more fundamental. Not that you are necessarily against the current system, but you would like to understand more. There needs to be political education. There needs to be education on the constitution. Right? And I hope at some point we will have that without being defensive and without feeling offended. Thank you very much for joining us today. And I want to thank, I want to join me in thanking uh, our panelists. I think they've added tremendous value in today's discussion. Kevin Tan, Pian Balji, Derek Dakuna. Uh, and, and a big thank you to all of you, uh, although some of you didn't contribute, but I'm sure you were tuned in. Uh, well, and to our viewers watching us live on iq.sg, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Questioning with a clear mind, from the heart, with guts. We believe in it. It's about time you do too. This has been IQ, Inconvenient Questions. <laughs>